So, good evening, and um, welcome to Writers in Conversation, a la 2017. Um, I am thrilled to have Tyler Keevil here with us tonight. Um, I have to read a quote from one of his uh, wonderful reviews. Um, in describing one of the stories in Bird Inlet, his uh, story collection, um, the, the judges for the Journey Prize, um, which the story Sealskin won, had said, straightforward and unadorned, but humming with subsurface power. And I think that can be said of a lot of Tyler's writing, whether it's the search for a missing snowboarder on a mountain on Christmas Eve, as in one of the stories in Bird Inlet, or a college kid working on an ice barge, another story from that collection, or even the wild summer that leads to the death of a character in his novel Fireball. There's a lot going on under the surface, and that's one of the things that makes his work so rich and compelling. Um, Bird Inlet was shortlisted for the Wales Book of the Year Award, longlisted for the Frank O'Connor and Edge Hill Prizes, and individual stories have won awards including the $10,000 Journey Prize. He's also written the novels Fireball and The Drive, which were shortlisted for prizes such as The Guardian's Not the Booker Prize, and reviewed widely. His upcoming novel, No Good Brother, will be published by Burrow Press in imprint of HarperCollins in 2018. And um, with no more ado, we welcome Tyler Kiefel tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carol. It's great to be here, and thank you all for coming. It's an amazing turnout. Uh, Carol underplayed when I asked how many people generally uh, show up. She said, oh, you know, about 30, uh, <laughs> even though it's, it's, it's a little bit more, and tonight is definitely a lot more, so that's awesome. It's really amazing to have a good, good crowd. I feel very... Um, professional with my microphone, the cameras, and, uh, and a sellout audience. That's really cool. And uh, yeah, we're just going to be talking about talking shop and hopefully yeah. doing a bit of reading, doing some Q&A, and I'm assuming at the end having some questions from audience as Lots well. Lots of questions for audience. You cool. guys should be practiced now at, at screwing your courage and coming up with questions and asking them nice and loudly for everybody. There you go. So, um, yeah, so do you want to start by a little bit of reading? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I can talk a little bit about um, the, the collection and the story. The first story I'll probably read from is Sealskin, uh, which you mentioned. I don't think it can live up to the hype now. It sounds really great. Won, won a big prize, and now inevitably it's going to be a, a total letdown when I get yeah. around to reading it. it but it, um, it's an interesting story. And one, I mean, we were talking just before we came here over dinner um, with Carol Niesha, one of, one of Carol's students. I get the name right. Well, she is now um, oh, a... Oh, ex-student, yeah, yeah, just graduate, sorry. Uh, yeah. She's about to be a doctor, um, and she's going to be teaching on the MA, but mm. continue. Yeah, <laughs> and, and the subject will have stories coming up and, and how you connect a sequence of stories. And for me, one of the ways I did that, and it kind of arose naturally, was through place and geography. And in part, that came about simply because I tend to write about home and looking back, and I tend to write about a particular series of locations in, in the Lower Mainland. I'm from Vancouver originally, um, and that's how the title derived. Uh, it's Burrard Inlet. It's a body of water that kind of divides the North Shore, where I grew up from the rest of Vancouver. And all the stories in the collection are set in or around the inlet of the title, if that makes sense, of so various places, or have a kind of glimpse of it. And in a way, I guess there was a little bit of cheating going on as well, uh, since one or two of the stories weren't quite on the inlet, but I said, you know, I worked in a line or two where a character perceives it from afar or something <laughs> like that. Uh, so there's always a bit of feint and parrying going on uh, when you're trying to create that cohesion. But for the most part, actually, kind of um, amazing how well that happened without me doing it deliberately. Hey, guys, come on in. Sealskin is set in a marina on the inlet, uh, a cannery. Um, which was loosely inspired by a real cannery that I worked at. But the story itself is fictional. I think that's important for me, having a, having a real locale to kind of hinge or pin a story to, and then creating a kind of imagined narrative within that framework. But that said, I, st I don't like to cheat the place or the location at all. I like that to be kind of specific and exact and as accurate as possible, even though presumably for 
any reader coming to it who doesn't know that particular marina, it wouldn't make a difference what color, say, the side of the cannery is, the name of a boat moored up at a particular place. Um, but for whatever reason, I kind of have a, a compulsion to get certain details right. And even though I'd worked at that particular marina, it had been a, a little while since I'd been back. So during the drafting and the rewriting process for Sealskin, I, I returned there and I kind of photo documented it for myself. Um, and that was really useful as I constructed the narrative to be able to refer to the photo. I almost had a kind of, not a 3D map, but a, the equivalent of, uh, of a, my own Google map of the place, but the various angles and kind of shots of, of different points within the marina. So for whatever reason, it's just one of the ways I work and it's important and it's, we, I think we all have our kind of quirks and ticks and things that we need to kind of find a route in, as a mentor of mine used to say, and, and that's one of them for me. So I'll read from Sealskin now. The story is set in the marine and it's essentially a, it, it's quite a simple premise. It's about, it's about bullying, really. It's about a young man working there who doesn't fit in, uh, who is not a union member, but he's kind of not really allowed to join the union, and there's a kind of murkiness as to how or why that came to pass. So he's kind of a, a, a target of ridicule and um, aggression and belligerence on the part of, of some of the other employees there. One of the things he does that's frowned upon is since, since he's, he's quite lonely and he doesn't have really any friends within the marine, is he creates a friend in a seal that is circling the, the marina and he takes ro herring from the, the row cannery and he feeds it to the uh, seal as a kind of just a way of, of hanging out with it, making friends with it, etc. And they keep warning him. They say, "Quit feeding that seal. You know, we don't want that seal coming around, or else." Kind of thing. And it seems like this vague threat. And this is the moment in the story where the threat becomes real and kind of concrete. He went outside and clambered onto the starboard gunnel and perched there bracing one hand against the cabin roof for balance. He shielded his eyes from the sun to peer at the two men and tried to make them out. It looked like Rick and Elmer. That's two of the guys who've kind of been bullying him. He couldn't tell what they were doing, but they were hunched over something on the dock. He felt it then, a sense of anticipation and foreboding, a kind of sickness curdling in his stomach. From the gunnel, he jumped down to the dock and landed hard, tumbling forward onto his hands and knees. Then he was scrambling upright, sprinting full tilt through the marina. His boots pounded on the wooden docks, which swayed and rocked underfoot like the floor in a funhouse. At one of the gaps between sections of dock, he tripped and stumbled and caught himself and kept running. As he drew near the gangplank, he slowed down. The men there were in the shadows of the wharf. It was Rick and Elmore, like he'd thought, and they were hoisting something off the dock using a rope they'd looped over one of the crossbeams that supported the underside of the wharf. He could tell by the tubular shape that it was a seal, his seal, but at first he didn't know what they had done to her. She was no longer gray and speckled like the sea, but bright crimson, and as they dipped her in red paint, made a pinata out of her. Then he saw the blood drizzling from her tail, and he saw the bare muscles and tendons, and he saw the way she hung there, all skinless and garish and shining like some nightmarish vision. He saw all that, and the men saw him at the same time. Rick was squatting down and tying off the rope they'd used to string up the seal, and Elmore was standing at his side. They turned to face Liam, and for a moment seemed uncertain how to behave. Spread at their feet were the tools they'd used to catch and kill her. A bucket of herring, a fishing gaff, some netting, a claw hammer, a serrated six-inch knife. There was also something gray and reddish and rubbery that looked like a jellyfish. Rick bent down to pick it up, clenching it in his fists, and lifted it so it unfolded to reveal itself. It was the seal's skin. The side Rick displayed was red as a matador's cape, and like a matador, Rick shook it to taunt him. I warned you, didn't I? I told you what I'd do. Liam said nothing, but only stood there. He had started to cry, and when they saw that, they made sad and sympathetic and mocking faces. 
They joked about killing his little pet and snickered at the jokes for each other's benefit. Standing there laughing with their tools strewn about them and the skinned body hung behind them and their coveralls spattered and red, they looked less like men and more like demons or some malevolent imitation of men. Liam made an outraged animal sound that wasn't a word and wasn't a scream, but something in between, and then ran at Rick and grabbed him and started hitting him. They wrestled and clawed and punched at each other until Liam felt something connect with the side of his head and then he was on the dock. He pushed himself up and rushed at Rick again and got hit again and went down again and this time he stayed down as they stood over him and kicked him a few times. Quick and vicious toe punts in the ribs, the back, the kidneys. He had closed his eyes and when the blows stopped he opened them and saw the two men looming over him. They told him that he was crazy and that he had brought this on himself and that he'd got what he deserved. Then they were gone and he was alone on the dock staring up at a blue sky. The seagulls were circling up there. They'd already caught the scent of fresh blood and, and meat and flesh. A few swooped down and settled on the dock. They eyed Liam and eyed the hanging seal as if trying to decide which one was dead. When he moved, they fluttered back out of reach and began croaking indignantly as he rolled over and pushed up onto his hands and knees and then eased himself to his feet. He felt as if he'd been in a car accident, not quite sure how it had happened, but knowing that it had, that it was bad, and knowing also that it was partly his fault. He was still crying, but not sobbing, just weeping steadily from the pain, the tears blending with the blood in his cheeks as if his eyes were bleeding. And on that cheerful note, we'll end it there um, <laughs> to leave it. Thank you, yeah, Karen. That's great. Um, I can't resist immediately getting really crafty on you. Okay. So I'm going to uh -oh. ask you a couple of Throwing a curveball. Yeah, we got to loosen things up. That was a bit serious <laughs> to, to start the talk off. No, because yeah. that's just such a beautifully written um, passage. And two, like, craft questions I sometimes look at as a writer, and I know my students mm. um, consider when they're writing, is um, came up for me. And one of them is, so how do you decide or when to use indirect discourse they ah, said a okay. few jokes and blah, 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 blah. Or when you use like the actual dialogue. Because mm. I, I notice the moment where they're making jokes, um, we don't hear the jokes. No. And I'm just wondering if you were, I mean, I'm, sh I'm sure you probably drafted the story a long time ago. Mm. But what, did you play with having all of that in direct and realized it didn't work? I mean, do you remember any of that process? Or if not, then in general, how you... Yeah, I mean, that's an excellent question, a very practical um, technique question that you don't often get asked that kind of thing at readings. I think it's great. I think, in looking back, I don't, I don't necessarily... Often for me, the writing, the composition process is quite instinctive, quite intuitive. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't consciously make those decisions during the, the drafting. But in looking back on it now, and in reading it, I actually noticed that too. Uh, Did you? It's just that, oh yeah, there's, no, there's hardly any dialogue. Yeah. There's one that one line. There's just that one line that Rick says to him, I told you what I do. And I think in part, it was, it was probably a way to avoid melodrama more than anything. You know, if, if once you start breaking it down into these kind of dialogue exchanges and shouting matches and insults and um, the jokes they're making, I think it could be done, but I think part of the power seemed to be in avoiding that and not letting it tip over into actually creating the the dialogue and the scene in the reader's mind but allowing some of that to be imagined if that makes sense yeah. so i think i mean that's a, a roundabout way of answering but i think that would be in that particular case mm. and and possibly it's something i'm moving a bit more towards now um i came i, I always say i came from a filmmaking background it's not true at all I, I, vaguely everybody from vancouver wants to be a filmmaker and there's loads of aspiring filmmakers so I used to run around with a cheap camcorder with my friends and we would make films and call ourselves filmmakers. Some of whom went on to, to become filmmakers, I never really did or was, but having come from that background, I think if I look at some of my earlier stories, they are very dialogue heavy. You know, they are films playing out on the page. Um, but I think one of our strengths as prose writers is to kind of move away from that and to, to make use of the tools that filmmakers can. And I think. Um, you can write great dialogue and you can create visual scenes on the page, but there's other things we can do yeah. as well. Yeah. I suppose that also that sort of indirect discourse sort of reflects his state of shock as well. Yeah, yeah, I would agree for it's sure. Sort of a, uh, there's a bit of a, a sheen, like a, 
like a sheer cloth between what's just happened and his mm. taking it in. So I suppose yeah, especially when he's kind of looking up and they're talking down to yeah. him. And again, they don't, you don't hear exactly what they say. You see, kind of have it reported secondhand. Yeah. 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 And the other thing he did really well in that scene that struck me listening to it was he had a great action scene. Action sequence. Okay, yeah, yeah. He had a fight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's not easy to do. No, I guess that's come up before. I, I did an event at, you were just talking, oh, we were talking about Pembroke, um, Penarth yeah. Book Fair, but I did one at Pembroke with uh, Conan Jones. Anyone know Conan Jones? Welsh, Welsh writer. Just a brilliant, brilliant writer. And that came up as a kind of parallel between our oh, bo- yeah. works that both of us tend to write. Were you when talking y- about The Cove? I wasn't talking about Cove yet, yeah. so The co- uh, Cove is his new one. We were looking at The Dig, so The Dig was a really great um, incredibly unsettling, disturbing text about uh, badger baiting, such a dig, uh, badger dig. And when you say writing action, it kind of tends to make it sound like you're writing an action movie or something. But I think it's also just that idea of physical action and being yeah. engaged with the physical world. And again, that's something I never thought of. I'm glad people, I thought of doing deliberately. You know, I never set out to say, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and do that as a staple or a, or a trademark. But I'm lucky that people appreciate it, or they mm. seem to like that, because there are so many other things that writers I admire do that I can't do, um, and that seems to have worked for me for for whatever reason, and yeah. psychologically or in terms of my own psyche, why that is, I don't I don't know. You know, I think it's it's partly possibly because I did do a lot of physical work, I did do a lot of manual labor, and I am fascinated by the mechanics of that Mm -hmm. and just the physicality of the world and our engagement with our environment, our engagement with nature. And because that's an interest at the back of my mind, it just kind of naturally starts to emerge in in my writing as uh, as I write, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, Do you remember how that story came to be? The initial spark? That's a really good question because it it was one of those ones that took a lot of different forms. So, don't, don't want to say failed, but I tried it various ways, and I tried it from various points of view, and sometimes you draft something, it's almost there, and you can just kind of keep working it in its current shape and kind of honing it in, and you're going to get it there, but I draft it, and I thought, no, that's not, not working, and then time being what it is, sometimes you let it fall by the wayside, and your, your mind goes off, or you, your, your life gets in the way, and you go in another direction, so there were various versions of seal skin over a period of six or seven years, probably. And earlier ones, so for those who haven't, <laughs> I've never assumed anyone except Carol who kindly had, well, you've read my collection anyway, yeah. but you would have had to read it to do the event, so I won't <laughs> assume anybody else has read. So for those who haven't read it, uh, it takes, the action takes place entirely over the course of one day. So earlier versions tried to chart a longer time frame, right, and mm-hmm. kind of focus on or deal with Liam's um, beginning and initiation into the world of the marina and kind of when he first first things start to happen, etc. the first kind of instances of bullying. That, I mean, that, that's a story that possibly could have worked, but it wasn't working in the way mm-hmm. I was doing it. And I, th- I mean, that is a, a big, big challenge for short story authors. I think it's probably something for those who are students of here, it's probably something that's come up in your workshops already, um, or for those who are authors themselves or writers themselves, that trying to chart a long time span within the context of a short narrative is really in- incredibly difficult. And it's one of the things that Monroe almost cha- not, not necessarily changed, but I'm sure other people have done it before, but she, that's kind of her sta- trademark, Alice Monroe, being able to make time malleable and flexible over short form. Um, but not being Alice Monroe, <laughs> I gave up on that version, and I just, you know, instinctively, it just didn't feel right. It didn't have power, it, 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 it had weak points, and it, it didn't have the impact I wanted. I think if you're going to, you know, I mean, there's, there's a clear impact moment there that I just read, and I wanted that feeling, and I wanted that, that you, you know, that state of shock. Um, and that emerged later, that emerged in another draft, and a, Looking back now, and I do wish I'd kept a kind of writing diary, how, how that transition happened or what inspired me to come back to it and approach it from the single day, I don't know. I just, it was one of those things that kind of emerged. Possibly you're having read something kind of can trigger, you know, uh, I find 
um, once if you're stuck or you know you always just take a break or go look at something else go do something else totally entirely but this was kind of probably years after the original and just coming back to it and thinking you know you you also you'll know that there's a story there I think if you really care about something and some material I once took a as a student I was in a workshop um, a guest workshop with Sarah Hall the British writer and she came to visit us at Aberystwyth University and I always remember she told us that a good writer is like a dog with a bone right you get a hold of something and you don't let go and I, this really struck me and I really liked really liked her approach and really liked her attitude um, as a kind of a disclaimer, what I added to that after, thinking that sometimes you got to bury the bone and leave it like a dog in the backyard, <laughs> and then you can come back and dig it up, you know, and still get a hold of it. So you, you got to hold on to it, but also you got to know when to take a step back or to keep it kind of in a safe space yeah. and come back. Yeah. And I think that's a classic writer's mistake anyways, to give a thing too big a f time frame, mm. to think that we need to know, like, from the day the that's character it. was born yeah. to, th you know, it, it, a, a, a a friend of mine who's um, an editor at Wesleyan Press, but Wesleyan University Press said that she thinks of short stories as like a, a book and we're just seeing a page. Mm. Like the, 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 you have an entire character's life as the book and the short story just chooses one page to tell and what page you're going to tell. And yeah. So narrowing that time frame is often a good way of... I agree, and, and I think it is a page, and it's a, it's a way it allows you then to charge the whole story with all the backstory, mm -hmm. and that the story is moving forward in this linear narrative of the day, but then at any given moment, the memories of all the things that have happened leading up to this moment, the day, you know, the day this happens, can crop up. And that gives you real strength as a writer because you're not just reporting what's happened, you're able to dip into the past mm -hmm. of that character's experience. So all those other days that didn't make the cut are there, mm -hmm. and when you need them, you can draw on them and reference them. And when you don't, they're still, I mean, that's the classic kind of iceberg theory. They're still propping up the story mm -hmm. too, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Agree yeah. with that 100%. Um, another thing that strikes me about this story is, is um, it's like a lot of the stories in Bird Inlet, which I just realized I've been mispronouncing all, this, all these years. Um, that's fine. I probably <laughs> mispronounced it myself. <laughs> no, you're Canadian. You, you, you're <laughs> doing it the right way. Um, is that the character sort of in conflict with the place? here. Mm. And I was wondering if you could talk about that as a, as a theme in your collection. Sure. So characters not just in conflict with each other, but with the environment yeah. itself. Yeah. So I wonder, again, one of those things, that I don't exactly know where that came from originally, but looking back, it's probably to do, and maybe that's a good segue to something I might read later on, with the fact that, so the North Shore, where a lot of the stories are set and where I grew up, you know, uh, we were 15 minutes from downtown Vancouver, really, by car, you know, 15, 20, depending on traffic. But at the same time, Deep Cove, uh, where we lived, is at the base of Mount Seymour. And you can go up Mount Seymour and be in complete wilderness. It's a snowboard, ski and snowboard resort at the top, but then kind of on the other side, it just keeps going and going and going. So it was this really interesting contrast of environments that completely urban, uh, one of the kind of, not big cities in North America, but North America, but one of the ones that's kind of known as, as a city and a tourist destination. And on the other hand, the, the wild, you know, the, the real wild and the, uh, the wild that you can get lost in, the wild that, you know, you'd have to be, you'd, you'd see signs down uh, the bottom of the street and bear sighting here, you know, keep keep your kids close or cougar sighting and, and there's a kind of real worry probably an over paranoia but but still this kind of awareness that this is there and just as we encroach on the environment it, it starts to kind of encroach back if that makes sense mm -hmm. and possibly that even if it was just my own fears of that I think start to kind of come out and a lot of the time in in the stories and I think in my life as well I think people who aren't ready or not prepared for engaging with the environments can find themselves in difficult situations, if that makes sense. And I wasn't a particularly uh, outdoorsy individual. I, li I relied on my friends for that. You know, if I went camping, I wasn't the guy who'd crouch over the camp stove and be able to start the fire with two sticks or, or what have you, you know. You brought the beer, did you? I, yeah, I, br I brought the beer <laughs> and, uh, you know, the entertainment. I told the story sitting around the campfire. That was my role <laughs> in the tribe. Every tribe needs a bard, right? <laughs> Uh, so I think in that respect, maybe this, uh, this idea that, you know, you have to respect the environment, your environment, 
you know, physically, and you have to be aware of it. And I think that also a lot of, I mean, a lot of the stories are set in water, and clearly with water, that is kind of paramount, right? That that idea that if you, as soon as you take it for granted, then you know you're all you're all adrift or all at sea kind of thing. So I think that's it, and possibly just the, the kind of wrestling with the, that kind of human nature interactions. I think are, yeah. are something I'm fascinated by. Yeah. I was thinking also of the place as in the the fishing indus mm. not industry, but that you know there's a lot of your I characters see, yeah. are you mm. know they're not really going to be fishermen in yeah. in their lives, and there's like and this character has a conflict with the his coworkers. Yeah, and I get what you mean. Yeah, so it's not just the with the natural world, but it's mm. kind of fish out of water um, mm. scenario, and I think that's very true and largely. It probably has to be, I mean, though the stories are fictional, that they are generally often based on experiences. And I think looking back, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't cut out for some of the things I was doing. Why I was doing them in the first place then is kind of a cause for wonder or concern. But I mean, there's all sorts of reasons. I, 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 was, I, I, I was enamored with that and throwing myself into experience and, and embracing new experience and doing things and jobs would come up. and whether it be in, in the shipyards, tree planting, or, or on an ice barge, you know, and the ice barge, there's three stories set on the ice barge, and maybe that's the one that possibly straddles that line a little bit more closely in that he doesn't feel totally out of, the, out of place in that environment. Mm. Um, and I have very fond memories of working on an ice barge that, you know, again, isn't the one in the stories, but kind of provided the base or the foundation or the inspiration for it. But... Ultimately, I wasn't meant for those worlds, mm. you know, and I think that's obvious to me now. But I, I do like there's a, the last kind of moment in the whole collection, the his boss on the ice barge. Say he's kind of joking because he's 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 made a foolish rookie mistake, greenhorn mistake, and he's cut his head horribly doing um, a job cleaning some rakes, which are kind of big, big metal. Um, girders essentially with hooked claws on them that comb the ice um, in, in an ice barge, which is essentially like a giant snow cone making machine that delivers ice to herring boats and fishing boats. So the narrator has made this mistake. He's got this, this injury and, it, and they kind of joke that, oh, it's going to scar. And he said, and his, his boss tells him, you'll always be marked. You know, you'll carry that no matter how big you get for your britches, no matter kind of how high fluting or where you go, you know, you won't forget. And in a way, I mean, that's clear, you know, the way I've pitched it now sounds almost ham-fistedly kind of symbolic, <laughs> but you know that idea of being marked by that experience. I think you know yeah. that, and and uh, yeah, I know you carry. We all do, though. We carry every experience with us, right? That old thing. I'm a, um, a part of everything I've met, or mm. um, that old old saying. So yeah, you feel a tingle in your scalp. <laughs> 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 you know, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So does anyone have a question before we hear Tyler read again? You weren't expecting this so soon, were you? Hmm. Throwing you off. I'm just warming you up for the next time. How um, many students of, of writing do we have here? Aspiring writers? There are a number. Number, yeah. Okay. Let's see. Don't Good be enough. shy. Put that hand <laughs> way up. <laughs> yeah. Great, yeah. I'm actually thrilled about Zach coming to this question. That's fine, yeah. We're in the same league then, yeah. Mm. Around himself, uh, like Mandarin it's like exploring the idea of um, indulging in that fantasy, but never being quite able to be that person. Yeah. And I was just kind of wondering if that was an intended theme of, of that desire to be someone other than yourself, or if it was just an implied desire. <laughs> I, I mean, that's an excellent point, an excellent question. Uh, uh, again, it's one of those tricky things about being, you know, about writing that you don't, you don't know how much is you've put there deliberately, and how much is there incidentally, which doesn't make it any less true or perceptive and I think that's a really good point and especially in that in seal skin where he kind of wraps himself in in this discarded skin as he leaves the, the kind of marina so he steals a boat and leaves and he's wanting to get out and I think if I look at my own life I think there is a desire to change it but also then you inevitably come up against their own limitations or the kind of or the our incapability of changing you know and there's a that great old, there's an old uh, 
I'm probably going to don't know who originally coined it, but an old saying that goes, wherever you go, there you are, you know, and you can't really ever escape yourself and you can't possibly truly ever change. But that idea of metamorphosis, of growing, you know, for sure, that's, that's, that's huge for me. And I think it's a big part of the stories, possibly a reason why I've ended up over here as well. You know, that you're always seeking, seeking something beyond the horizon and, and seeking a, a kind of place where you can be something that you weren't previously. Um, and then you look in the mirror and you're like, okay, yeah, you're still the same person. And, you know, but there you go. Yeah, thank you. Great, great question. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, but that, um, what's nice about that action mm. is, um, and maybe the reason it doesn't come across as a symbol, because you don't want that, um, was, um, is that it can be interpreted in a lot of different ways, can it? I mean, you, that's a really nice insight, I think, um, Harriet. But then also, it's so, it, you could think of it simply, I th sort of it as sort of a mourning as well, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, yeah. you know, as a kind of mourning. Um, and even a protection as well. So it's a lot of different things, I think, which is... Uh, yeah, I mean, you're right. So maybe that's possibly why it works. I'll, I'll soak up that compliment. I love <laughs> it that you can't... It's, a, it's an ambiguous symbol. Yeah. And it's true, yeah. And I think also possibly just the idea that he's identifying with a different set of values and not that right. value of cruelty and the destruction of, of yeah. nature in a way, you know, with the seal and what it represents. But but something else and possibly something else that he has to leave to, to find or be part of. Yeah. 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 All right. We want to hear more reading. Great. Okay. I feel like it's, it's going to be another downer, but <laughs> there you go. Then we can loosen up and we'll, we can, we can. The short stories. And yeah. There you go. Fiction. It's hard and, and hap fiction. happiness doesn't make good drama really. Right. <laughs> so this one is going back to what I was talking about, about the, nearness of the kind of wild and specifically I actually Carol referenced it when she gave me my introduction about a, a snowboarder um, who's gone missing so it's about that and this is something that kind of happens quite frequently uh, fre by frequently I mean you know once or twice a year somebody might be out of bounds and, and go missing and sometimes they get rescued and, and other times they don't uh, it could be a hiker it could be a skier snowboarder and in this instance, in, this, in the fictional instance of the story, it's somebody who's gone missing on Christmas Eve, and the main character uh, is a member of a volunteer search and rescue crew and has been called up the mountain to help look for this missing snowboarder. And there's kind of an ambiguity in that the, the search and rescue um, operative is not necessarily playing it safe himself and clearly identifies to a large degree with the person who's gone missing, if that makes sense. So there's this kind of sense that, that this idea, I mean, that's the, the case, I think, for a lot of sports, isn't it? You know, this idea that the risk is what um, makes it worth it. And without the risk, there is no reward. And then one of the stories I teach in an autobiography, a nonfiction module myself, and I look at Into Thin Air, which is a John Krakauer climbing text that they turned into the Everest movie. And in an interview, Krakauer has kind of said that, you know, the, the whole thing about climbing is that it's risky and that things can go wrong. Um, and, and without that, then there's, you, you take away some substantial part of it. So I think that's kind of also lurking behind this as, as the person is trying to do the responsible thing and, and look for the, the missing rider, but also kind of engaging with it um, on another level. So I'm picking up the story just at the point to where um, he's been searching the mount mountain alone and has come across tracks, um, possibly the tracks of the missing individual. From there, it looked like the kid had ridden further west into the trees. It didn't make much sense because in that direction, the woods became too dense for riding. Within 10 or 20 yards, the kid would have been forced to turn back towards the trail. Once his breathing steadied, Mark brushed the snow from his bindings and strapped in. He twisted around and angled his board downhill and slipped into the other track. It was a familiar game and one Mark played well. Following the kid's line, he wove in and out of ice and crusted pines, heading west, always west. Branches slapped across his thighs and torso, showering him in snow. He pulled his goggles down to protect his eyes. He'd never ridden this route before, and as he went deeper into the woods, the trees thickened and the riding became more of a challenge. 
The treetops created a canopy, blotting out the moonlight. The turns grew tighter with less time between them. Huge rooster tails showed in the powder where the kid had made cutbacks to avoid obstacles, stumps and rocks and fallen logs. He was thinking that this kid had to be good to be able to carve like that, and then he didn't have time to think anymore because the darkness made it dangerous and he had to almost feel his way through the trees, focusing on his own turns and not losing the line. He bent low and his mind emptied, and he dissolved into an awareness of his body in which everything became attuned to right, left, right, that rapid, weaving rhythm as he slipped through the dark with tree trunks flashing past and branches whipping at his body and snow whispering beneath his board. Then the trees broke and the ground dropped away and he was floating, airborne. He instinctively grabbed the front side of his board with his left hand, like he would have during a jump, and extended his right arm to keep balanced in midair. White ground rushed up from below. On impact, his knees buckled and he fell backwards against the slope sinking into a pillow of snow, but managed to spring upright without losing his momentum and without losing control. He was covered in powder, and as he surged forward downhill, he pumped his fist and yelped like a coyote into the night, because it felt as if he'd pulled off the impossible, landing that cliff blind and in the dark, something nobody else could have done except maybe this kid he was following. He'd come out in a wide and empty bowl that went on and on and on. The only marking in the snow was a single track of sweeping arcs nearly perfect in their symmetry. He knew then that this was why the kid had come here, and why he'd come here tonight, and why he'd come here alone. It was only through following him that Mark had found a part of the mountain that he'd never known about. He felt as if he'd come across hollowed ground, and he leaned into each turn with special reverence, stretching his body out parallel to the slope, trailing one glove through the soft powder. With the wind pulling at him and the cold burning his cheeks, he mirrored the turns across the bowl, so that where the kid had cut left, he cut right, and vice versa, weaving figure eights into the pristine snow. As he did this, Mark glimpsed something flickering at the edge of his vision, but when he glanced over, he saw there was nothing, just his own moon shadow skirting the snow, keeping pace. Further on, the bowl became a glade dotted with pines 10 or 15 yards apart. The snow-heavy trees were bowed towards the ground and the white, Gnarled shapes looked like shepherd's crooks planted on the slope to mark the way. Each curve of the figure eight turns now encircled one of the trees. Mark carved around a trunk, the branches brushing against his shoulder like a slalom gait, and cut back across the kid's line and flew past another, back again around another and another and another. And then he stopped. He hadn't crossed any track on the cutback. He reached down to undo his bindings. They were encrusted with snow from the ride, and he had to brush them off before he could pop the clasps. He suspected what had happened, but couldn't be sure. There was a chance that the kid had hurt or injured himself, clipping a tree branch maybe, and had managed to hold on. But it was a small chance, and by the time Mark had stepped out of his bindings, a coldness had settled in his stomach, leeching the exhilaration out of him. Grabbing his board, he dragged it behind him as he trudged up slope, and that was how he found the body. He could, seal, he could see the heel edge of a snowboard jutting out of the snow and the kid's feet still strapped into it. The rest of him was buried. He must have been doing a front side turn when the loose snow at the base of the tree had given way. He would have sunk into it like quicksand. His head looked to be five or six feet below the surface. More snow had probably fallen from the tree as he struggled. Mark wedged his board upright in the snow shrugged off his pack, and assembled his three-piece shovel. He began to dig. And again, on another very, very cheerful note, we'll leave it, leave it there. Thank you very much. <laughs> Great. That has a beautiful ending as well. Well worth uh, looking up for those of you who haven't read it yet. Really, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so one thing that always strikes me about your work, and, um, and this may be um, a reflection of my own North Americanness and perhaps the occasional homesickness, is it, mm. does, it does seem to me like a lot of North American writers, um, and sort of male writers, and I don't mean like the Norman Mailers, but more <laughs> like you know Richard Bausch or yeah. maybe Tobias Wolf. And I'm just wondering, are you... Are, are there any particular writers who you sort of 
were steeped in younger that might have had an influence? Is this something that you're aware of? Um, or maybe you completely disagree with me. No, no, I mean, I think that's a fair enough point. Um, I'm trying to think back now to the writers that charged me when I was starting out and how that changed and how that has changed and is changing. And I mean, I suppose, I mean, one of the things I, I try to bring to my own classroom, I was just lucky growing up that I had good teachers. And you know, you have a teacher who's passionate about something and they pass on that passion and they pass on particular authors to you. So that's one vein. And I definitely think you know, the, 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 the big North American writers, and I mean, one that always crops up, at least stylistically in relation to my work, is Hemingway. Mm. And partly to do with that fact that, you know, writing about action or m the mechanics of the physicality, and partly to do with the fact that it's like paired back, paired back prose. And that definitely, had, that, was, that was university for me. You know, I had a really great American literature teacher and some of the texts that I was introduced to then, um, Fitzgerald as well, um, Hemingway, Plath, uh, they've stayed with me and they still affect an impact on me, I think. Then there's other writers who you come across on your own and they can be just as important and just as powerful. And I'll never forget for me a massive one, not as well known, but uh, I also think you have a, a particular relationship with authors and nobody's told you to go <laughs> find, you know? And I remember walking along Lonsdale, uh, Lonsdale Key, which is an area in Vancouver, on, happens to be kind of looking out on the inlet. And there was an old, a secondhand bookstore, and you know those kind of bargain bins they'll keep out front. And I think all writing students and English students will do this. You kind of peruse or look through those bins. and. I found a copy of a book by a young woman called Eden Robinson called Trap Lines. And she's a Canadian author of Heisler descent. And the fo it's a quartet of novellas and they absolutely floored me, you know, just opened my eyes. And one of the things that they did for me, and one other book did this as well, but there's a, one of the, the kind of flagship story, and it's called Queen of the North, which is frequently anthologized in, in Canadian literature um, books now. And there's a sequence where the young narrator, Karaoke, comes down from northern BC to Vancouver. And um, some of the places for, I think it's Trout Lake Leisure Center that she goes and visits were places I knew, you know. And for the first time, and it seems so straightforward, and it should be so obvious to us, but literature until then had always been something over here and it was written about places that were so far removed from my own experience and from my own life and from who I was. And then to see that and to have it on the page and to be, this is Vancouver, you know, this is, this is my city and you can write about that and it's literature and it's okay to do that was huge, you know? So I think some of the technical aspects of, the, of those larger North American writers, but then trying to find also personal writers or writers who are writing more closely related to your kind of mm. background, well, not necessarily background, but your geography. Again, that idea of geography and place and culture. And there's a great moment, slightly different stylistically to me, but I think you can't really be a writer from Vancouver without being aware of the importance of Douglas Copeland. You know, someone's had such a big impact in, in, on the world stage. And in his book, Girlfriend in a Coma, there's a, a kind of opening sequence where a footballer, I think, is going up for a catch and he kind of collapses. And the, the high school and that field is something that where it wasn't Seacove where I went to school, but it was where we used to go and play, you know. So again, that idea that it featured hugely kind of Vancouver and these places I knew. And that kind of just seemed to, those two texts seemed to give me license to do that as well. Um, so yeah, like we could go on and on about yeah. influence, and I guess then there's other authors and that you love, but you are doing something so different from what you can do. So you almost can only admire them from afar. You know, I was joking before about Alice Munro, and I just think she's, an, you know, it's redundant to say an astonishing writer, Nobel Prize winner. She's she's um, you know the great, arguably the greatest living short story writer, but so talented in a way that I almost just have to worship and, and maybe one day, you know, 
trying to pursue that path and to do the things that she can do in the, in the short form. Whereas other writers, you can seem, for whatever reason, you, you seem able to more closely emulate, I think. Yeah. yeah. To spin it back at you, what about yourself? I can, I can throw a question your way. Um, big, big no, influences. That's not allowed. Yeah, I'm not allowed. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're a short story writer as well. Do mm. I what? Sorry. I said because you're a short story writer oh, as right. well. So yeah. Yeah. Um, I actually, um, I, th I think um, in some ways, some of my um, early, early influences are male American writers. Okay. Not yeah. so much female American writers. I mean, I'm not sure I like John Updike that much anymore, but. I feel mm. like there, that that was a super early influence. I don't necessarily admit all that often. That's what's funny too. And then you try and outgrow, and you you know you always <laughs> have those writers that you know are massive at one stage of your life, and then you start yeah. to kind of. I mean, for me, because I, I, the drive is a road novel, right? And I think you know there's a load of young people who go through the phase that Kerouac is so so cool and so great, and you know you want to go on a Kerouac road trip, and. Yeah, now I have outgrown that stage of my <laughs> life, and I look back, and I, you know, there are there's a big you know a, a debate to be had about the technical qualities of Kerouac's prose, yeah. uh, but at the same time, it doesn't change the the fact that it meant so much to you at one stage. In a way, the drive kind of arose out of that. You know, the drive is about somebody trying to emulate a Kerouac-esque road trip and just coming up against the well, coming up against the realities of his own existence and and realizing that you know the actually going on it is never as cool as it is depicted in in a kind of yeah. glamorous romanticized version of it so yeah yeah so um but i think currently the uh, there are certainly more women writers who i emulate now the, the contemporary writers than mm. than there maybe were when i was really young so um it's like ann patchett and yeah. alice mcdermott and are two like big influences. All of a sudden, the minute you start talking about writers, you blank that on anything you've ever written, <laughs> ever, or, or read, ever. <laughs> just sort of like can't come up with anybody. But, yeah. um, all right, more questions for Tyler from the audience. You know me, I can always come up with stuff. Yes. So you mean the titles? Yeah. Mm. yeah. Yeah, I mean they're so they're notoriously difficult, aren't they? And 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 kind of settling on one or the other. I think for me sometimes a co when you when you can pin it to a concrete noun or a kind of central image, that is one, a straightforward way to make it work quite readily. You know, sealskin, scrap iron, um, fish hook. There are these ones, and those are kind of charged objects, as it were. And actually, it's interesting, I, I do an exercise, uh, a very fun freewheeling exercise based on advice Ray Bradbury gave about how he kind of had his breakthrough, kind of the, the, the genre, speculative fiction American writer. Um, and he said it came when he started writing lists of concrete nouns down for himself. And he would just brainstorm a whole page, the lake, the scythe, the skeleton, the carnival, um, the baby. And often for him, because he's a horror writer, he's a genre writer, they are things that have menacing connotations. And then he would pin that concrete object to the top of the page and start writing. Um, very, I mean, as you can see, it's a very, very simple premise, very simple exercise. But it's, it's, it's great fun to run with students. And also, you know, it, it kind of that, that lingers in the back of my mind that, okay, yeah, you know, if it works for Bradbury, it can't be, <laughs> can't be a bad thing. Uh, and then other, when I look at other ones, though, I think that one I was just reading from the snowboarding story, Carving Through Woods in a Snowy Evening. Um, I think the, that's probably my most poetic title, and it's clearly you know, ripping off or referencing um, the Frost poem, uh, that, which goes back to that same American lit class where we studied Frost, and I was always kind of haunted by that, you know, stopping by woods in a snowy evening, um, and that idea of miles to go before I sleep. So you know, at the end of that, the, the main character kind of almost gets lulled into a sense of complacency. Um, of how nice it would be just to stay up there. Um, 
So that, I think that, that was more a thematic title that kind of emerged through the course of the process. Um, so everyone is kind of different, which is no help at all to you. But <laughs> I guess talking around the subject can help and just kind of voicing it. What about you? So you said you had trouble. How do you tend to find your ultimately a title for a story or you tried all different things or? Yeah. Mm. It's so true, and it's so tricky because other people will say, "We'll use a line from within the text," you know. But I always find there's then the like, cheesy clanging moment where you like come across it. Oh, that's the title. That must be important, and you're kind of like self, you know, yeah. referencing back and forth. Um, and then there's great stories about you know famous writers struggling with titles, and uh, you know we, we, I've already mentioned Hemingway and Fitzgerald, and kind of combing through classic texts to find you know, grand things like For Whom the Bell Tolls or what have you. And then the original titles for, I don't know if you guys know, anyone know the original titles for Gatsby? They're just atrocious for The Great Gatsby. You know, they're terrible, they're crazy, crazy titles. And, and luckily Max Perkins kind of set them on the right, right track with that. There were things like um, The High Bounding Lover, Gold Hatted Gatsby, Trimalchio and West Egg. You know, would, would we still be reading The Great Gatsby a <laughs> hundred years on if, you know, if he'd called it Tremalchio and West Egg. I, yeah, I, think, I think great books need great titles. Um, one other tip, last tip, this is fun, fun talking about titles. Somebody once told me that the, the best titles tell you the whole story in the title itself, you know? Um, and it, even a, sim a title as simple as, if you look at The Great Gatsby, you know, it's embedded there. You know, The Great Gatsby, what's the book about? Gatsby, why is he great? I don't know, we still don't quite know. Um, and that's the <laughs> mystery of Gatsby, and that's why it's kind of stuck with us all these years. We all bring something new. We don't even quite know who he is after all this time, and every generation can create its own kind of Gatsby. So, there you go. Yeah, good, thank you, great question. Others, yes. Those are the best, I love the simple questions, yeah. Those are the hardest, Rachel, <laughs> come on, you know that. <laughs> She, um, it seems as though it's this really kind of elusive thing to, in, 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 like, in order to create a really convincing place. I know there's not a huge amount of guidance. People just talk about how important it is. And, um, a fellow Canadian, John K. Sampson, mm. he um, wrote a record recently called Provincial, where he Oh wow. All the different problems. Yeah. Yeah. capturing place. So that's fascinating. So he said he uses vernacular, vernacular as a way to capture the place. So using the language of the inhabitants to kind of, that's interesting. I think one of the, and it, maybe that links to this point, that one of the things, and maybe one of the errors I would make, and people might tend to make, is thinking of places as separate to character. Maybe what he's doing there, that's a direct connection, right? And for me, I'm um, speaking of influences, big influence was Steinbeck as well, and something like Cannery Row, right, which is, again, a place, pinned to a place, sequence of collected tales or linked tales. But the character of Doc in, in that is studying the marine biology and the kind of creatures in the, in the tidal pools. And, I mean, there's a direct relation or parallel between that and us as authors trying to anatomize the people of a place. And I think our geography and our environment shapes us and creates us and makes us who we are. You know, you can't separate people in place. Um, so maybe that's kind of what he was getting at. How people talk is partly dictated by that the environment, the social environment, definitely cultural environment, but also the physical environment. Um, so I don't know if there's any one shortcut or trick or tip I would use to capturing that. 
but I agree with him that the inhabitants and the place are interrelated and that the stage has to kind of connect to the players and being enacted on the stage. Possibly take, I mean, then the, the next question is, well, what happens when you take somebody out of that environment and put them somewhere else? And, and that's a, I guess that's kind of fish out of water story we're mm -hmm. talking about and, and being put into a, a different locale or a different environment and one that you're not suited to. And the friction that is thus generated can then lead to drama or conflict. Um, and maybe choosing the right detail, something a simple, simple question with a simple answer, you know, the right detail, not getting bogged down too much, despite what I was saying earlier about all the specifics and taking all these photos of, of, of the marine and stuff, but it's also about knowing when not to do that and when to just use something, you know, a simple key and vital that will get it all across rather than pages of, and reams of description. Mm. Yeah. Great, these are amazing questions. I love the technical ones, ones about actually building a story. You never get asked that. So I, yes, Aji. I'm not sure if this is the right way to phrase my question. Mm. Um, you're primarily a fiction writer. Uh, how important are the elements of nonfiction in what you write? Or is it, do you need that as a background? Do you need to do research mm. for your fiction pieces? Or how does that work? Yeah. Great, no, that's excellent, and, and one um, that's always tricky to answer. I had one, a, a writer friend who used to say, oh, well, you tell me, you know, how much is real and how much isn't? Uh, and some writers can confabulate and, and, and just totally weave a story out of thin air, and I hugely admire them, and I, I just am not like that, and I never really have been, and for whatever reason, I, I do need that kind of underpinning, even if it's a fictional story, I need to have a sense that it could be real um, and uh, being able to draw on my own experience and being able to draw on what I know. So for me, yeah, it's vital, it's crucial. And maybe that allows you then to kind of go back to your question about to use the right details or to construct a sequence or a scene to build a place. You know, it's not a research detail. You just know it. Um, but I totally, I'm, I'm very, very much understand there are many writers who would disagree with that entirely. And I think maybe the key thing or the vital thing is, even if you're writing about something you don't know, by the end you do, or you learn it and you teach yourself. And I work with a colleague who is a big David Foster Wallace fan. And whether it's, it's a true anecdote or not, I think he once told me that, so Wallace was writing, I think it's the Broom and System, the, the book, one of the books about accountancy, that by the end he was one, he, was, he, he studied, accountancy to such a degree that by the end of r having written the project he was one module short of having like a degree <laughs> in accountancy if that makes sense so there you go so even though he, it wasn't his personal experience he researched it to such an extent that he knew it into the same way that somebody who has done it would there you go yeah hopefully fingers crossed for being recorded that that anecdote's true but if not i'll blame on my colleague who told me so <laughs> yeah that the anecdote I heard was about Ian McEwen. Okay, yeah, tell us that. He was researching Saturday, and he spent like a lot of time in, in surgery, and that somebody else was visiting when he was there, and of course he had a robe on and stuff, and asked him a question, and he answered it, and he was right. No way. Yeah. So there you go, yep. Um, Which is also a fun part about being a writer, that kind of the research stage, it's the only time we get to, I often, you know, you envy actors who get to, you know, go to all these different roles and kind of different locales and they get into character and you know, method actors. So that's our chance to kind of be method actors, um, to kind of throw ourselves into the research and really get to know and experience a totally different life or a different mentality or different mindset. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'll ask you a quick question. It's not a quick one, but I, I'm going to ask <laughs> it. And, and Sounds good. I know there are people out there with questions. So, um, but it struck me that your um, short stories are sort of very perfectly formed. Okay. And that your novels are much more sort of fragmented and, <laughs> and, and, uh, and that's not at all a criticism, but it, uh, is, that, is it the form that is making that happen or is it hmm. the material? I'd l we were joking earlier about being self overly self-deprecating and the dangers of that, but possibly it's just the fact that I'm, I'm I'm not a very good novel writer, so that my <laughs> novels are kind of uh, the shambolic affairs of, of, of pieces put together. Uh, but I, I, I do think it's the form as well. So short stories, yeah. you know, very demanding for me. There's no room for that extraneous 
yeah. you know, the extraneous sentence, let alone extraneous scene, especially when you're writing to kind of word limits of, of magazines or of contests or of particular submission criteria. Um, so I think that's part of it. I think also that's one of the joys and benefits of longer form that you can go on a tangent or you can go on a detour and you can explore or you know th there's that kind of cheesy thing people say about the characters start doing something on their own or talking or acting in a way you didn't expect and it, you know it sounds kind of grandiose but that can happen when writing a novel where they do surprise you or startle you and then you can let them go whereas when in a story you might be more prone to rein them in and keep them on track to, towards this kind of epif epiphanic moment or whatever mm -hmm. that you're building to. Uh, so I think that's partly it. I think also maybe the structure of my books is quite fragmented because I was a, a short story writer first and mm -hmm. as I built towards that it, it was a way of you know short vin vignettes, short scenes, it was a way of making novel writing manageable by having these kind of short punchy chapters which are almost kind of like short stories with, uh, with growing towards something larger. Yeah. And is your new novel coming out next year, is that like that as well? No, I mean, in a way, that's a really excellent question because I think possibly it took me two novels to learn how to write <laughs> a novel. Uh, not that my first two are, you know, aren't, and I don't want to disparage them because I really stand by them, but, and possibly also in, you know, in the modern climate, novels don't have to have that kind of overarching structure that they traditionally had. And, you know, the kind of fragmented nature makes them a little bit more cinematic and possibly a little bit more read readable. But... No Good Brother, I think, for the first time, feels a little bit more like an overarching mm -hmm. plot structure or sequence where, you know, one flows slightly more organically, one mm -hmm. sequence f flows a bit more organically into the next. Um, whether readers will respond to that, whether that's a good thing, I mean, it's kind of a retro, it's got a retro feel anyway, I think a lot of my stuff does have a retro feel, so hopefully that works, you know, that, yeah. you know, even in a, in a kind of, with a contemporary tale in a modern setting, the, the, the flow and feel can kind of be a throwback to old days, yeah. yeah, yeah. Hmm. Okay, who else had a question? We got one over here. Ah, that's, thank you. Mm. 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 Yes. <laughs> that's that's a good question, and I think the answer for me would be a definite yes. And one of the things that often comes up when looking at story, looking at my own work in a draft form, or looking at student work, and one of the things I was challenged to do, and I try and challenge my students to do, is you ask why this moment or why this day. You know that you've got however many days in a whole life, but your reader is only going to spend for seal skin or whatever that one day with this character. So really it has to be the day. You know, it has to be the day that changed changed them or something at least something changes, you know. Um, so you want to pack in as much as possible and it could be charged with the rest of that life. But yeah, you want to you want to be a kind of de definitive moment, I think. Um, without, of course, you know, looking for going overboard and making every single thing, you know, a, a melodramatic or or a, a huge um, a kind of bombastic story and, and, I, and it, you pick so many tips up I think teaching creative writing from other colleagues and you see what your students respond to and one of the things um, my colleague teaches is that short stories should also be about the quiet eddies you know they shouldn't be um, which is something Richard Ford said you know they, they shouldn't have huge melodramatic moments they shouldn't be people killing other people possibly he would frown upon seal skin or killing killing a seal um, but charging those quiet days with the real drama and real tension and, and everything that's behind them. Yeah. Great question, yeah. Others. Do you want to talk about your path to being a writer? My path to being a writer, yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> where was that? How did that happen? <laughs> oh, it's good. It's a funny path because it was just based on loneliness in many, in many ways. So I was joking earlier about w being a wannabe filmmaker and everybody in Vancouver kind of having filmmaking aspirations, uh, which I did at one time. And with filmmaking, I mean, it's fun. fun. It's not, that's one of the differences that it's a, it's a really collective enterprise. You need a team to do it. You got collaborators that you work with. 
And when I was in my mid-twenties, I left Vancouver and moved to mid-Wales on a, a kind of work, what they call a working holiday visa at the time. I'm not sure if those kind of um, things are always changing, um, which meant I was limited to about 16 hours a week. And I came out here because I, um, I'd, I'd met my then girlfriend, now wife, when I came to do an exchange here at Lancaster. So we thought, okay, we're gonna have it, we're gonna have it, make a go of it. And I got this visa, uh, a hope and a prayer just kind of came out. And she was working pretty much more than full time, but more than full time, because it was with a the community theater company touring around all these places in mid Wales. And when I wasn't helping them, con you know, with a set or doing a bit of get out, and they tried to throw a bit of work my way when they could, I was. You know, I had three hours a day cleaning toilets in a garage, in a spa, Texaco garage. And then I'd go home to our little flat and I literally had nothing to do. You know, because they, when they're going out and do a theater show, they'd often be overnight. They'd be, uh, or if not, they're, you know, do the get in, get out. And by the time she got home, be well past midnight or what have you. And I've always had a lot of creative energy and I did have, you know, screenwriting aspirations. But, you know, without that, that team or without those collaborators, I started kind of directing that towards prose and I started writing short stories at first and I mean it's amazing the when I look back now just the ability to that focus that's something I'll never have again and I, I I do miss that you know just that idea that you could just that's that's all I really had to do and it's doing especially manual labor job a couple hours it doesn't drain you know the the the, the creative part of you whatsoever so I was writing short fiction, and mostly I started with short fiction because I couldn't imagine writing a novel. You know, there, there are writers who have that confidence, who know they're born novelists, who set out to write a novel as the first project. But I definitely didn't have that. I didn't, I've never had a large, you know, a, a lot of intellectual confidence. Um, so I was writing short stories, and I started sending them off. At first, I was all over the map creatively. You know, I was writing science fiction. I was writing horror. I was trying, I was trying to write... I don't even know when looking back, what did I want for writing? I was trying to write stories for Bella and Best, you know, those like kind of funny um, romantic stories or relationship drama stories that they, I was just, just writing, just writing and sending things off and trying. And inevitably, I guess like a weather vane or, or, or um, something trying to <laughs> find, find its course eventually, I, I did. And I kind of settled on literary fiction, and I still write speculative fiction. I still write sci-fi, um, to on a on a kind of smaller smaller scale as, as side projects. And I ha then I guess the other thing is once you get a breakthrough, you get some support or a pat on the back. That kind of gives a, a stamp of approval and tells you you're moving in the right direction. So I always reference, always remember, and pay homage to the fact, so I, I sold two stories. One was Spec Fic, and that was to a magazine called On Spec in Canada, um, to an editor called Diane Walton, and that was massive for me. And the other was a story called Feld to Francesca Redark at New Welsh Review, who's then editor uh, of New really? Welsh Review. Yeah, uh -huh. uh, and that was another really big moment, you know, and that, I, and that was a kind of, both those were, I, I placed things previously, but both those were kind of professional sales, and then you think you're going to get the bug, you get, you know, it's almost like being infected. You think, okay, I've done it once, I can do it again. And, and it, it's a kind of real impetus to keep going and you keep going. And then inevitably, it's, I think, I mean, again, we were joking, talking about this or earlier that nobody really wants short story collections as a publisher, tend not to, which is, I mean, the great thing about our publisher, and that's why it's amazing that Parthian does support single author short story collections, but that's pretty rare. And people start asking, oh, okay, yes, are you working on a novel? You know, and it just starts to be kind of some, something that's lurking there and a wait. And so, uh, so I started to try. And the first thing I did, and I, I mean, I was joking earlier that I've written two novels to learn how to write a novel, but there was, everybody's got one dead novel they keep in the bottom of their drawer, and I definitely had that. And I thought, okay, I'm going to write... <laughs> I can't believe I'm telling you this. Uh, it's like an, <laughs> I've admitted it before, the existential thriller set in Prague with Russian gangsters, and it was so <laughs> moody and young mannish and so angsty. And I got about three quarters of the way through that, and while I'd been writing it, you know, and I'd, I'd been n noting down these anecdotes and just sticking them in a drawer, almost like I didn't want to admit what was going on on another level. But you can kind of know in your heart when something's 
faltering like, the, like a car, like an automobile, and the wheels are coming off. <laughs> You're running out of gas, and the fender is just dropped off, and it's 20 miles behind you on the road. And eventually I sat down to write this novel, and I just didn't have it in me. You know, I just looked at it, I said, this is not, I'm not proud of it. I don't care if it sells. I don't, I don't want to stand by it. I don't want to stand behind it. It's not, not me. And so I, I you know, and it, it, that was hard. That was really hard because I was just saying about that anecdote about Sarah Hall and the tenacity and you never give up as a writer. Uh, but other times you, you do have to give up and that was one of them. And then kind of out of the ashes of that, when that novel fell apart, all those kind of weird anecdotes and urban legends I'd been noting on scraps of paper that I was keeping in my drawer that were about the cove or about North Van were about home and were largely just kind of from homesickness, you know, things that I recalled and things that I'd left behind. And again, that idea of loneliness and looking back. Those, I got them out and I started looking at them and thinking about how they could be shaped into a narrative. And that's basically Fireball. And that's what huh. Fireball kind of grew out of. And I guess partly it was to do with what I said previously about, I, I also was reading a few things at the time that made me realize, well, novels don't have to have this kind of mm -hmm. shape and structure. Um, I love Joyce Carol Oates, another kind of author that I really admire, and she often has fragmented kind of stories that jump around um, in, an, in a non-linear way. And, and I think that allowed me to write a book that's not really, you know, look at Fireball, it, it is, you know, 50 or 60 some odd stories um, that don't necessarily have, you know, a, an overarching plot aside from, you know, the, the summer and this one incident and, and, and Chris's death that kind of links everything together. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that and then, but then once you got that, who knows, at least, though I didn't know it was going to sell, but I knew it mattered to me. Mm. You know, I didn't care. It was one of those things where you did not care a whit what anybody else thought of that mm. text. Um, because you weren't writing it for anybody else in a way. And then when it was done, you, you send it out and there's all that kind of process, which is probably slightly boring. We'll go into all of that, but you know, the tribulations of where to send it to and who, but really I was just really happy and proud to be with Parthian to pick it up and, and they kind of got back to me and they said, who are, wh who are you? Why are you sending us this? You know, I was like, <laughs> this weird book about North Shore. And I said, oh, you know, I have to explain, well, I'm, this, I'm this Canadian guy, I live in Wales now. And, and actually, that's something I didn't mention. Rich, that kind of doing talks like this, Rich Davies, the editor of Parthian, had come to visit our class. Mm. And he said something that really struck me. And it's one of the things I've appreciated about the Welsh publishing scene then and have ever since. And he said, you know, yeah, we're interested in Welsh writing and we support Welsh writers, but we're also really outward looking. And he mentioned a writer called Gail Hughes who wrote a short story collection called Flamingos for them. And she was from Canada um, and she was from the area. Again, that notion of geography that my folks grew up in Alberta and the Badlands. Um, so obviously that resonated with me, you know, and he was kind of talking about that and he mentioned that and I, I picked up that book and I think I even mentioned it, you know, when I wrote to him, um, you always try and strike that balance, not doing it in a, in a kind of sycophantic way or whatever. But I said, oh, you know, I, I saw you and you came to talk to us and you mentioned, you know, you mentioned that. Um, so, yeah, and it worked out and uh, I've been happy ever since there. Yeah. And, and also kind of other publishers mirror, it's been great to me. So I guess I've been, you know, I've just been happy and lucky to work with some really great people. So, yeah. I can't believe you weren't writing in Canada. No, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was pretty young when I came out, but no, I yeah. wasn't, uh, you know, writing in loosely or casually in the way, you know, yeah. you know but not, nothing, no sense that it could hack, uh -huh. you could do anything with it. Yeah. Last chance for questions. Not a single one. All right. Well, um, thank you very much, Tyler. It's been really great. Thank, thank you. you, guys. Thank you. I realize that most of you know me anyways, but I forgot to introduce myself today. <laughs> I was a little like, uh, you know, um, startled by having these, uh, start, like having our chit chat, like broadcast to the world. So I think that threw me off. That'll be my excuse at least. But anyways, I'm, I'm Carol Burns, um, head of creative writing, and I run this um, reading series on behalf of our English department in association with um, NST Theater. And um, I must, 
I've lost my word. I, I must. <laughs> well, I will remind you that um, the wonderful independent bookstore from Southampton, October Books, um, has books here. Tyler is happy to sign books for anyone who has one on hand already or wishes to, wishes to purchase one tonight. Um, and I want to mention the other two readers that we have coming up this semester. Um, the first is Evan Placey. Evan teaches script writing for us and in, in the English department um, and is a playwright who um, has a lot of his, who last week, I believe, had a um, play here at Nuffield called, somebody remind me. Consensual, Consensual thank you. Um, Evan is going to do a, a scene from that play, will be um, done at the next Writers in Conversation on February 13th, I believe. Um, and then there'll be a Q&A led by somebody from the Nuffield, because I'm on sabbatical this coming semester. Um, and then on March 13th, we have Claire Fuller, who is coming out with her second novel, um, swimming Lessons. It was just reviewed in The Guardian on Saturday, got an excellent review. Her first novel, um, Our Endless Numbered Days, um, won the Desmond Elliott Prize. I think I've got the right prize. Um, so, um, and that's on March 13th. So do join us for those, spread the word. You can find us on YouTube if you've missed the last five or six, they're, they're available. And, um, Great to see you here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Tyler. Thanks,